and Chris. Uh, thank you for joining us. We're so uh, glad that we have have you on with us tonight. So I put a mural up for my background. This is um, in the Potala Palace in Lhasa. And I had asked a, a, a Tibetan man I had met when he visited the Library of Congress with a delegation of Tibetan scholars. And he was a curator at the Potala. And so he would will often show me parts of the Potala. And, and I asked him, where would there be like a mural that sort of the, that would show be like a Tibet, the best sort of traditional Tibetan map of different sites. And he thought this was a good example in, um, in one of the rooms in the Red Palace. Wonderful. And Ijamba has prepared a few photos for us to just have a nice little warm up to okay. get us in, get us up in some snowy mountains and some back into some history. And also uh, there's a nice, there's a map in there that's a, a, a kind of a, cult, a cultural folk map too. So Anila, would you like to show those things? Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, um, I think that um, uh, all of you uh, who are on the screen tonight know Emma Cobb very well, so um, I don't have to introduce her uh, to you all. You're all uh, good friends. As you know, Emma is co-hosting uh, this uh, event with us and our previous book talks as well. But I would like now to take a moment to uh, introduce uh, Professor Carl Ravik. Um, he's the Professor of Heritage Studies at University of California at Merced. And um, he uh, works in the Department of Anthropology and Heritage Studies. Uh, he's, a car he's a geographer and um, he is the author of this uh, very interesting book, uh, An Historical Atlas of Tibet. And um, I'll ask Carl a little bit more about how he came to um, this wonderful field of work in a moment, but um, he um, was just sharing with us beforehand that even as a boy, he loved making maps of his, of his neighborhood. And um, he graduated from Clark University uh, with his undergraduate and after a, um, a master's at Harvard uh, in East Asian Regional Studies. Um, he got his doctorate in geography at the University of Minnesota. And in between, he did some uh, work um, that uh, influenced him a lot, um, working um, in um, uh, as, uh, as a geographer in the U.S. Defense Mapping Agency and um, we'll find out more about how he got interested in maps of Tibet at that time. Um, his doctoral fieldwork was in the Jansu Valley uh, in central Tibet. And so um, uh, Carl's lived and uh, spent uh, a good deal of time in Tibet and, and knows the countryside well, as well as actually the, creating these uh, first of their kind uh, maps. And um, as a little aside, when he was uh, working at the, in, in Washington, D.C., uh, at the Defense and Mapping Agency, uh, he studied, um, uh, he learned uh, his, some of his Tibetan from Kimball Kalsang Jeltsin. Uh, and so they uh, studied together for uh, a while. And uh, um, 
Carl can tell us more about that. But Carl's been a good friend of Kim Kalsong for many years and also uh, of um, our uh, center there in DC, as well as the center in Seichen Kunjapling. He's visited here several times and um, he's just fascinating to talk to. And so we're so glad that uh, you've spent, um, uh, you're spending some time with us tonight uh, to share your work and um, answer some questions about your book. Um, Carl, I'll give you a moment to um, uh, to um, uh, add anything that I may have have omitted, um, um, especially um, anything that you'd like to share about how you became interested in Tibetan geography and uh, devoting your career to it. Okay, yeah, well, thank you for having me, you know, everyone, and good evening if you're on the East Coast. I'm, you know, here in California a little earlier. Um, I guess it, just in a nutshell, you know, growing up in the 70s, I became interested in the martial arts. And 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 at that time, and then when China started to open and, and, the, and I'm in college in the early 80s, I, I sort of, I found out from someone, well, if you go teach English for a year in China, you know, it'll give you a plane ticket and maybe a little apartment to live in. And I just thought, well, that sounds great, you know? And so I started studying Chinese in college. And so I felt like, well, I'll just go and this will allow me to learn more, you know, and every, you know, and then a lot of people when they were in living in China would go to like, you know, they'd say for their winter break or their summer vacation break, they would say, well, we'll go to, you know, go to Tibet or somewhere. So I tagged along a friend wanted to go to Tibet and I hadn't really thought that much about it. And so then that made me very interested, that experience. I, I realized there's a lot to study, but I didn't want to, you know, really go into academia. Like a lot of people after four years of college, you're just done with school, you know? And then uh, I thought, well, I'll get a master's degree and look for a job. And then, you know, being sort of interested in mapping and Chinese and, and, and a little Tibetan at that time, you know, in India, it's like, well, where can I find a job? You know, <laughs> so the only job I could find was the defense mapping agency. And in other words, of meeting, of saying, well, who wants these skill sets? You know, who's going to give me a job to make maps of China and India? You know what I mean? It was like, sure, there probably were like NGOs and more fun, interesting places to work, but I wasn't, you know, it just didn't occur to me. You know, I just, I just sort of like, well, this is what I have as a skill who needs it, you know? So I'm, I'm in the defense mapping agency, pretty miserable, not really liking the job, you know, going to begin my cube 40 hours a week and, and, and figured, well, but the nice thing was, is there was like the, a lot of offices in DC, like the late Lodi Gyari at the international campaign for Tibet. And I don't even know how I, I ran, I found the Sakya center. And then there was also this good Kagyu center, right? Where I lived for a time. And um, and so then Lama Gelson was kind enough to say, well, uh, you can come every Sunday and, and I'll teach you Tibetan. I thought, you know, for $5 a day, you know, for that every Sunday. And I thought, well, that's great, you know? And because, um, so then um, I started to, um, just applied it to grad to, to PhD programs. And then I then I was ready. I was like, oh, you know, uh, I'm ready to go now and and study this stuff. And so, so you know, that's it. You know, to make a long story short, you know, um, and I I did my PhD at the University of Minnesota, and then um, in 2002, I was lucky to get a job at uh, University of Wisconsin Stevens Point as an assistant professor of geography. And it had a really strong mapping program, GIS program. And they were happy to just say, hey, we got a cultural geographer, but who will use GIS and make maps of history. And they thought, this is great. You know, this will show people there's more value to GIS and cartography than just environmental science, you know, that it actually applies to culture and history and religion. And so I was pretty happy there. And it was, you know, and I didn't even think until, um, I was arguing in 2005 at a conference with these people who are working on the China historical GIS project at Harvard are saying, well, all you're doing is taking this eight volume PRC 
Historical Atlas of China, which is the C CCP's view of Chinese history and Tibet and Xinjiang and Mongolia. And I, I just was saying this, you know, you're just, all you're doing is digitizing this PRC Atlas. And then right there, I, I just spontaneously said, I'm making a historical Atlas of Tibet. Because <laughs> I figured, well, the reason that you couldn't, you know, because there was no historical as of Tibet, people were just stumbling in terms of trying to figure out where, how Tibet figured through history. You know, it, it helps, you know, like have, because, you know, there's other countries tend to have historical atlases, right? Um, so yeah, so anyway, so in a nutshell, that's how I, so I spent 10 years, so it was, and then it was published in, I, I sent the free a PDF. I got a draft PDF, like just before it was published. You know, the publisher sends you kind of like a like a draft, and so that um, I kept the publishing rights to my maps. I had learned enough from, you know, hearing people, um, um, you know, like all those famous singers as they're old, they're regretting. Gee, why didn't I keep the publishing rights to my songs? You know, so I. I kept the publishing rights to my maps so I can give everyone the maps, you know, and so that's good. What an amazing gift. Uh, you've certainly given the world the maps. Um, um, I oh, must say that um, uh, His Holiness the Sakya uh, Trichin um, has uh, received a copy of your book and he was fascinated by it. He spent uh, several afternoons uh, going through it, uh, studying the maps because um, there was not that kind of there. Though there weren't those kind of maps in Tibet, right? Well, no. Like behind me is a pretty good example of sort of a traditional Tibetan type of cartography, which was in the murals and the tankas, where you know they're showing the places, but it's it you know it's not obviously based on um that sort of modern western cartesian space model um which i suppose in western history you started to have with the exploration of this of the ships they needed nautical charts you know people had to locate themselves in a way that you don't in tibet like when you're traveling in tibet if you if you just start walking or you maybe you hire someone's yaks or horses to go along with you there's sort of like just well-trodden paths going to a basic mountain pass and and you know if you said to someone i need i want to go to you know sakya or i want to go to Kham or i want to you know people would just you could just anyone you ran into a local herder or a local farmer would just sort of point you a lot you know you you got to stick to these trails and so you don't no one really needed these modern, I think you needed maps historically, right? Like like we think today of a, of a map. One thing I'm interested in about your book is how these very old um, place names and very old uh, names of peoples and um, ancient locations that may not be extant anymore how did you locate those so precisely to put a dot on a GIS map? You just basically you have to do a look at a lot of different sources. And since that's what I was doing at the Defense Mapping Agency, the whole thing was I was also put on the U.S. Board on Geographic Names as a staff member. And, and so for 100 years or, you know, I say since World War II, basically, they had ramped up. They, you know, basically the, the, the whole idea was, as a name, a place name changes, at least in terms of the Romanized form that that country wants, it has, has promulgated, you know, we would have to sort of research it and say, yeah, you know, it, it was, um, you know, Peking for that, for such and such reasons, but now it has to be Beijing for such and such, po you know, political reasons mainly, but there's a linguistic, um, you know, reason behind it. So I started applying, you know, looking at the Tibetan place names. There were a lot of old Tibetologists who had done this, like Gisepi Tucci or um, um, uh, Wa um, Wiley, all right? You know, the, so there was a lot of, of classic works by the Tibetologists from the past 50 years there um, where they 
worked out, you know, I mean, so basically that, you know, the Tibetan names would just come from historical Tibetan uh, books, you know, mainly by the lamas, but also inscriptions on murals, you might have on like the mural behind me, if it says this is, you know, this is Sakya, or this is um, Gunkar Chode, you know, like you could sort of look at how did they write that inscription, exactly what Tibetan form did they take for the inscription. Uh, but of course, you can, <laughs> you can find historical Tibetan books that might have a misspelling. So, you you know, but um, yeah, so so then you find it on um, Google Earth has made things really easy. But before Google Earth, you could take um, the best available topographic map of of that part of Tibet, locate the, <clears throat> locate the place. And often it would be uh, looking, it was the great explorers, mainly British, French, German, from the uh, mainly the 1920s to the 1940s, you you know, and you would basically I would take their maps and, and they would have gone by the famous most of the famous monasteries. And 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 you know, there was really no towns, there were hardly any towns in Tibet. And so I've argued that the, the monasteries were urban centers. You see, it's just that Western um, bias doesn't didn't allow Western scholars to say this large monastery was actually sort of was an urban center because a lot of monks had had occupations like there was a tailor, there was an astrologer, there was a, um, a, a like a banker, a, a, a lender for no, of seed grain, but they would calculate the loan and keep an in, what the interest would be and stuff that had to if that seed grain had to be <laughs> so you know the the all these old monasteries were like a thousand let's say the biggest there were like certainly a, a thousand a big a thousand big monasteries of like more than a hundred monks let's say you know those were like all the towns of tibet right so you know though so there were towns i mean a lot more towns than just what there used to be like there was just chamdo lhasa she got a gang say say tong, you know, and then that was like it, you know. Like, but the the monasteries were like old Sakya, you know that that was a town, really, right? In a sense. All right, so that's how I would find, you know, you would just find every all the find all the places, and then find what the Tibetan name was, and then cross check it to what like a, a Western, a common Western name or, and then of course you have the Chinese names, which luckily, I mean, I, I'm fluent in Chinese and really being fluent in Chinese has helped a lot because I'm, I'm, I'm making a historical atlas of calm now, right? I, I didn't, if you, I didn't cover calm in much detail in my atlas. It's like, so now I'm going back and I'm mapping all the old monasteries of calm. It's a huge project. A lot of Sakya monasteries and um, um, all of the, the, the recent books from the, I mean, like all of the county um, gazetteers that the PRC has published in the last 20 years, they they'll they'll actually detail a lot of the old monasteries, but it's all in Chinese characters. That's <laughs> really annoying. So uh, <laughs> I'll have to take the Chinese character and I kind of can guess from it now what the Tibetan form what would be i mean that's it's and also they'll give the, they'll say like the second karmapa founded this monastery but it'll, it'll be all in chinese so they won't you know so it's it's um um or they'll say um you know um um Pakspa, like the great sakya lama Pakspa founded this in the 1200s right but it'll just be if the chinese for pa you know pa 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 or pa pa or, you know so yeah it's uh it's a, it's um it would help me a lot if if everything was in Tibetan. <laughs> well, I think that's um transliteration and we do that too with yeah, Tibetan. Yeah. We transliterate the Tibetan into English and I that's right. It's interesting that they're transliterating reiterating the Tibetan into Chinese. It oh, um, yeah, kind of yeah. one of the interesting things about your book is how it shows um how well one question is, is how big was Tibet? And of course that changed so much over time. And also there's, uh, you know, different perspectives from different societies. Tibetans say our country was this big. Chinese say uh, it wasn't a country, it was a province or it was 
this big at that time or whatever. It, it, first, it's changed. And second, uh, who's talking about how big it was also changes the size of it. Um, but also what's actually meant by Tibet, too, because you have these fascinating maps that show the linguistic spread of the Tibetan culture, for example, um, and um, the spread of um, the language, but also uh, the culture, also uh, different, um, different ways of counting what Tibet is. How do you kind of balance all those when you have to get really specific and draw a line that shows how big Tibet is? Well, along with a bunch of other like to historians of Tibet, we were working a lot in the 90s on these uh, research projects. And um, they sort of developed a term, the polity. A polity could have been anything from like the great Ganden Podrong government of the Dalai Lamas to um, um, a small, um, like the, the, the kingdom of Derge or, or Nangchen in Eastern Tibet. And they, they just use the term a polity and instead of a state, you know, or, or something. So polity is very nebulous, you know, like you could have, um, and I often I wouldn't bother to, there were no, I don't think there, there wasn't, you know, literally, lines on a map or anything like that um often it was just um the agricultural estates that like if there was a polity like a great monastery that had so many agricultural estates that uh provided them with butter with barley you know then you know that would they, no one really the mountains are so high and vast in tibet no one would bother to hike up to twenty thousand feet and look for a boundary you know what i mean and and then a lot of the wealth was in the yaks and the sheep and so a lot of the monasteries and the estate the polities would actually um a lot of like the great lamas were given horses yaks and sheep as donations because a the um, uh, worshipers, uh, their followers might only have had that kind of wealth, you know? So they, they, instead of saying, here's so many gold coins, they often would say, I'm donating, you know, th three good yak to you or something like this. So a lot of the monasteries would just it put in the care of, of different nomad families or clans. They would say, hey, you know, these hundred yak are ours, but, you know, you take care of them up in the mountains and then maybe at certain times they would come in and say okay and, and bring them so, and say here's so much butter um or you know uh um, not so much they wouldn't slaughter so much you know they basically it was ranching they basically just wanted to milk milk the, the well the female yaks so you'd have like 90 percent was female yaks and maybe 10 percent were bull yaks right and so the wealth was mainly based on the barley and the butter, right? I mean, those are the two main things. Um, so polities were, you know, that's how I would look at it. I would just, basically you just map the great monasteries and that pretty much gives you where the great centers of wealth and power were, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I have a, I have a silly question. Um, yeah. Um, is there really such a place as Shangri-La or Odiana or Mount Meru? These mm -hmm. enduring names, where do you, where did they come from? Are they just well, fantasies? Well, Sham Shambhala, or? of course, the Shambhala became westernized as Shangri-La, right? And oh. of course, we all know about the, the, the 25, the great, the kings of Shambhala and the mythic realm of Shambhala as part of the Kala Chakra initiation. And that's very Tibetan, right? I think the there's scholars who have looked at the, this for early um, texts of the, um, like Birnbaum's book, The Way to Shambhala, that was published in like the 1980s is a pretty good book on this. And then from ancient India, it's like a lot like Mount Meru, Odiana, you have, of course, from the this, this Sanskrit texts of ancient India, ancient Buddhism in India, you have and and then a lot of these were also I believe the you know the Hindus and the Jains also had a lot of these concepts right but you're right I mean it's it's mostly these are like what I would call like mythical geographies or cosmic geographies um 
I, I love them, but I mean, I was more like in like a, a beautiful old Tonka or a mural of, of this stuff, but you know, I'm not interested in trying to, to map I, it. <laughs> I see. So, so probably uh, Shambhala, Shangri-La is actually, was actually a locatable place at the time, but Odiana oh. and Mount Meru not. Well, no, I mean, Shambhala is also this mythic, uh, no oh, one I see. really okay. knew where it was. I mean, supposedly, like, I think the fourth Panchen Lama wrote one of the more studied guidebooks to it, right? But I think, he, I don't, he didn't say this is, you can get there specifically, I think, you know, it, but it was, I think, um, it was like, you can't, maybe you could get there, but it would be a, an act of faith or something. Right? I see. Yeah. Very interesting. Do we have any kind of similar thing like that in, in uh, uh, mythic places in in the West? Well, we have, you know, like um, um, Asgard with the Norse mythology, right? Mm -hmm. And that certainly, like, I think the concept of Midgard, Asgard, maybe Tolkien's Middle Earth concept, right? <laughs> right, and then... Um, we have um, from the classical Greeks, when they had um, these different concepts of what, like Hades, right? And, you know, and then heaven and hell. I mean, just the whole Christian idea of heaven that, you know, sounds a lot like Shambhala to me, right? Well, thank you very much. Um, these have been some kind of just general background questions, but now I'd like to turn it over to Emma. And we're actually going to open up the book and look at some maps. Okay, good. Yeah, well, um, thank you for all the questions, Anila. And, and, and Carl, this is just an incredible book. I mean, it's really was is so much fun to go through and i'm i'm still i'm still looking at it um i mean it's it i it's just the kind of thing that you can return to and find new things and in, in these images um over and over again and i mean one thing that i just have been thinking about a lot in going through this book is how what a different kind of information we get from from maps mm -hmm. that we really don't necessarily get from, you know, more traditional narrative history. Um, so I'm hoping you can talk a bit about that. Um, and some of these maps, so some, I don't know if we're able to bring any of them up on screen, but um, the first map, you, you have some maps in the beginning of the book that are really helpful for sort of setting the stage um, and, um, map five, which shows the structure of Tibetan history, um, uh, core regions, peripheries, and trade networks around 1900. And, but what you've done is you show, yes, there it is. Thank you. Um, the, uh, basically the concentration of Buddhist and Bun monasteries for a thousand square meters. And it's just incredible to see in a glance where, where the monastic activity was or at around 1900. And I'm, I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about how you created this map, how you put the data together and, um, and created this, this image. And, and I know there's, a, there's also a, a, um, a diagram really interesting um, diagram in the same chapter with the map that shows the um, the growth, the increase and de decrease in monastery construction over over the um, the centuries, which is again just so fascinating to see this kind of visual information. Um, so please um, tell us tell us about about these images. Yeah. So the map. Um... Basically, um, what we did is we, I had access, always been interested in the, the Chinese census data, which isn't very accurate. I don't, I know, I think they, they rigged the numbers, but at least they have a very um, um, detailed system of, 
of counties, just like in the United States, and, and they have townships within each county and towns. And so um, what we did is for just all of, of the Tibetan areas in the PRC, we, lo we, we found a point for it, each, the center of each of these towns or townships. And then we just used GIS to make a little equal area for each one in, in and then a, a lot of the all of the data on all of the the monasteries often it would um um we would uh, i could ju i just totaled said okay this township had seven has you know we know there's seven monasteries that were in what is this township today or we know there were you know 15 monasteries and what is this township today and so then it it was easy to just work out the density per like per 1000 square kilometers which they do, that does the numbers don't really matter rather it's the it's the pattern the spatial pattern so now we see u and tsang u tsang central tibet and we see kam as having dense sort of a dense pattern and amdo and and western tibet nari um you know not so much this is i think um that this is very general you know it's there's we probably missed a lot you know this is this is more based on what we know has survived not it's not taking into account sites that might have um, been abandoned in, in you know, 500 years ago for whatever reason maybe um but yeah it so it, it it what we find actually with in tibetan studies is people tend to specialize so if you you know a lot of um uh t tibetan scholars will say oh I, I i'm an omdo specialist or i'm a comm specialist or something and so you can sort of see why you know they they like you know they sort of have these and west you have sort of these four great regions so it's sort of like but it's sort of like in the u.s would be like the mid the west the midwest um the east coast the south the northeast it'd be kind of like these what we call folk you know geographers call i like the term folk regions right some people have used the term cultural provinces, like, you know, I like the term a, a folk region um, um, because the, the, the Chinese administrative divisions don't make a lot of sense. If you just say, well, what's in Qinghai province or what's in Sichuan province, it's just so useless <laughs> for trying to figure this stuff out. Um, um, yeah, so so this was, but also I, that graph I made, um, I've missed a lot of sites in Com. That's why I'm going back now and I'm making a historical atlas of Com. So that the so Amdo is, I'm sure Com probably had about as much, if not more, as Amdo. Uh, but but the 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 ups and downs. This is we would take the the year of one thing that really interests me is when was the monastery first founded usually by which llama and you know there it might have taken 10 12 years to actually build a good big monastery but and then they added over time to them but at least there's usually a, an official year of like you know what we call what the groundbreaking ceremony or something you know when and and sometimes we only know it was it was the 15th century so then i would just say okay 1550 or it's the 17th century, okay, 1650, we would just, we would just average it out. But we see how, um, let's see, we see how in uh, central Tibet, you have most of the, of the um, in the in early days of the Tibetan empire, most of the, of the building of the temples was in central Tibet. It makes sense with the support of the Tibetan emperors. Um, um, and then, then we have um, different, um, um, you know, just different sort of patterns of growth and decline. Um, it, it was just, you know, just taking the data, just showing people one way to look at it. Um, it there could have been big climatic patterns that, you know, like, was it really dry for a century? Was it, you know, you know was there a long-term drought? And we don't, really know a lot about that but could that have affected these patterns right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. why are there not many monasteries in Nadi? it's so dry and sparsely populated uh, you know nari is an amazing place but you'd you 
in 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 central Tibet, you can or Amdo, you can whether you're at one Buddhist Tibetan monastery, you could actually see another one and walk there within a couple hours. You know what I mean? But in Nari, you literally would have to what you could walk all day like someone could probably walk for 10 hours and not necessarily get to the next monastery it might be a two or three i mean they're really spar you know they're really spread out um and and it's probably because it's so dry there's relatively very little uh barley fields and arable land spots in you know little pockets it's and it's it's like it's sort of like looks like arizona or or you know new mexico um it's so i think yeah i think i think that's why nari it's very famous for the work of rinchen zongpo the translator and how you know tolling monastery was founded in the late 900s and then they invited the guge kingdom invited atisha to come and stay for a year or two before he moved on to central tibet and um was influential in 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 starting with the local Tibetans in central Tibet, like Rutting Monastery, the the Kadampa tradition, right? But so Western Nari, you know, sort of brought Buddhism back in a way after the the imp the imper the imperial period. But um, yeah, there are just not a lot of uh, you know, there's not a lot of. Uh, of monasteries in um, Nari, um, because there just you know wasn't that much barley and butter <laughs> to be had there. <laughs> it's it's just so interesting how, I mean, the, the, clearly from you know these maps and and explanation, the the monasteries are really hold the history of Tibet in them. I mean, it, 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 it's, um, mm -hmm. I mean, as you, as you said earlier, um, the, you know, that this is that, that they were, they were, they were the towns, they were the, they were the centers. Um, and the, uh, sorry, let me just, sorry. Sorry, I think I went offline for a second there, but if not, um, in any case, uh, the, the the monasteries were really the and the monastic activity um, was sort of the the, the pulse. Um, I'm hoping we can also look at another map, uh, map sixteen, which um, is. A map in there's a section of your book um, that covers the period of 900 to the 1640s, which you call the period of union, and um, um, when there was a lot of activity. That's um, very interesting, um, and particularly for for those of us who are practitioners, because um, there was there was so much activity um, and and monastery building um, all over. And so map 16 shows central Tibet in the period 900 to 1240. And um, mm. we can see from looking at this, how differently the different um, Tibetan Buddhist schools uh, distributed themselves and how differently some of them. So Sakya, the Sakya, um, seem to have been more concentrated in their development and the others were more spread out. So could you uh -huh. comment a little on that and and what what you make of that and what we can what we what we can conclude from those differences? Yeah, well, this is when Sakya Monastery was founded in was it what the 10 hundreds or uh, 10 hundreds, right? 1073. Right, 1073. And what I did is, I made a larger circle. If you look at the um, legend in the lower left, we have um, a um, seat of a sect, like a, I call it a, a mother, a mother monastery. That would have been a monastery with a lot of little branches. So, you know, like Sakya was one of the Sakya tradition. 
Um, I think for the Kadampa, right, it would have been Rutting, right? I think Rutting Monastery um, would have been, oh, here it is, actually in the very far north there, right? Our, our other ones. And um, and so, um, but I also was showing what we know about after the fall of the Tibetan Empire and like the eight, like the nine hundreds, there were maybe these um, these regional uh, principalities. So I just sort of showed them in the red font just for reference. Not that they really know a lot about them, but um, yeah, it was mainly amazing just looking at all of the um, all of the monasteries built in this period, which the, they. The scholar Tibetologists call this the the Chidar or the second diffusion of Buddhism. Apparently, you know, the first diffusion was during the empire under the uh, Tibetan emperors, and then that. What's interesting, I guess, is the Nyingma Pa monasteries. the The Nyingma Pa um, um, would have, in a sense, they would trace themselves back to the imperial period, at least by legend. But then the other sects that we, the, the great schools, the Sakya, the, uh, the Kadampa, the Kagyu, those had sort of specific founders and specific mother monasteries that were that were built. Um, whereas I guess the the Bonbo, the Bon monasteries, and the Nigma monasteries were less. They were they were more um, organic, right? You know, they were sort of just. They 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 weren't sort of based on a specific school. I think as much, right? I think it was more in recent centuries that the the Nyingma had these great monasteries that they looked to as sort of like mother monasteries. But I think that happened by the seventeen hundreds, eighteen hundreds, or something like with like with like Mindro Ling, the Dorje Drock, and some of these places. But um. If you look at the the map before this, all of Tibet during this period, right, uh, which would be the, it should be map fourteen, right? Um, well, it would be a, a while. Um, it would be. Um, What I did in the atlas is I would always start with a map of all of Tibet, the whole plateau for that historical period. And then the following, the map would just be central Tibet in detail. And then there would be Western Tibet in detail and then Amdo in detail and never comp. There was never, I never had the time and resources to make a, a detailed map of comp. So, it, it, you know, so that's why now I'm going back and making a historical atlas of Kham, but here, this is good. See, I put this little box up here of like the Kagyu schools had a lot of, of variation. We speak of the the four great and the eight lesser Kagyu schools. And then we had the um, the Sakya and the um, the Kadampa school, I say of, of, Katisha, of Atisha. But what's interesting in Western Tibet, um, these uh, a very good Tibetan scholar from Nari. Um, he he you know he pointed out that the great monasteries like Tolang and these other important mo monasteries in Western Tibet, really in the ten hundreds eleven hundreds we would have to call them the new Tantra tradition school of Rinchen Songpo because they weren't Kadampa, uh, they they you know and they weren't um, anything else and so. Um, but it, it, this, this, these sort of, it died out over time and then it just, they sort of became taken over by either the Kagyupa, the Sakyapa or the Galukpa over time. And, um, but in these early centuries, we actually have a specific school in Western Tibet based on what Rinchen Tsangpo started. Um, and then, um, Yeah, so go ahead. What's your other question? 
Um, well, so <clears throat> since we're looking at these <clears throat> maps from this this period, um, and you mentioned your your com your work on com, um, there's other maps um, shortly after this one. I think it's map twenty two, um, and there's a few maps that show um, from the Mongol period. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the Mongol period. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> That's of great interest to Sakya practitioners, um, right. because, because um, Sakya was so important during this period and had such a connection with um, the Mongol leadership. Um, so uh, I I love yeah. to hear. Well, what was interesting about the Mongol period, which is, I I start at twelve forty because that's when the the first Mongol military you know, cavalry column or whatever first got to central Tibet, I guess was 1240. And at first, um, interestingly, it was the um, the um, the Drigong Kagyu school based at Drigong Monastery east of Lhasa, that for some reason, the the, the Mongols first made the the uh, the Drigong Gompa uh, like this, uh, this um, some type of official, not monastery Gompa, um, like official, um, their sort of, uh, I put it here, vice or a monastic seat of the viceroy of the Mongols, right? But that was only for about 20 years. And for some reason in 1264 or so, or I can't read this, is this 1268, the, the, right? Um, the Mongols, um, then they shifted to the Sakya Ponchen as their viceroy and temporal administrator. And one theory I had, if you read my text, is the um, the Sakyapa had in the 1240s or 1250s or something, had actually supported the kingdom of Gungtang, which is just north of Mustang. Um, no, it's, it's north of, I'm sorry, north of, um, of the Kirong Valley and, and now north of Kathmandu, but on the Tibetan Plateau, they had, so they had started to expand into Western Tibet. So one theory is, you know, the, the Mongols sort of figured out after being in Tibet for a while that the, the Sakya were way more organized and more way more efficient than the Drigon Kagyu were in terms of what, in terms of um, having a better um, um, layout network of, of, um, of, of monasteries that they could work with. And, 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 and so that, it, so, um, but it's it's interesting um, to some extent. Um, it was if you look at my map, the detailed map for Central Tibet during the Mongol period. I called it a period of symbolic Sakya rule because there were the, the Mongols um, gave these um, like seals and titles to about twelve or thirteen monasteries in central Tibet and they called them tree corn, which um, Giuseppe Tucci, the early Tibetologist translated tree corn as miriarchy, the Greek word for like a, a leader of like a thousand families, but, but um, using a Greek word miriarchy isn't really appropriate for, so, uh, but tree core, it meant um, kind of like this local center of, of authority, you know, and, and what's interesting is all through the 1200s, so we're talking 1200s into the early 1300s, is that some of these other Mongol supported um, um, uh, tree corps or 10,000 household units, the Chinese would translate them as Wanhu or, or you know, 10,000 household units. Um, um, these, like the, like the, um Sal Gung Tong and Densit and and the, the the ones in in um the Pakmodru with the great monastery of Densitil nearby, they could send, they they directly went to the Yuan court. They didn't have to work through the Sakyapa to also go directly to the Mongol court. So so you know to what extent it was it wasn't like um, 
the Sakya had total power over central Tibet or all of, but rather they had a lot of power and they were seen as sort of probably the, the greatest authority, but the apparent, they couldn't, I think they couldn't really tell like a Kagyupa monastery, you know, well, you can't go to the Imperial court in Dadu, what's now Beijing. It, however, but then, but then there was a, a local war where actually the Sakyapa burned down, didn't they burn down the Drigong Monastery in the 1290s or something like that? So there obviously was, um, you know, conflict, local conflict, and probably just because of the Mongols, you know, the Mongols are coming in, creating this empire, you know, local groups are going to um, want to be, not be shut out of, of trade routes and, um, and, and everything, you know, so there must have been a lot of uh, conflict at the time. And in fact, there was a great battle here in Gongtang in, I can't, you can read this, where the, the, the Chagadai Khanate in, in what's now the, based in, in what's now the Tarim Basin into like in Turkestan, one of the great Mongol Khans of the Chagadai. Remember the, the Mongol empire, devolved after being one supposedly one great empire it actually devolved into four khanates so kublai khan the, you know had china right but then one of his brothers or something had the chagadai khanate and then another one was the ilkhanate in what's now iran and they converted to islam <laughs> which you know they gave up on buddhism which made sense given where they were located in you know in 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 and in, in what's in persia and then there was the Golden Horde, right, up more in, in the, uh, towards Russia. So there was a big battle fought for control of Tibet and, and, the, and Kublai Khan and won out. And so um, that, may, that probably weakened the Kagyupa too, because I think a lot of the Kagyu monasteries were um, going with um, the Chagadai Khan. And, and it's all the Mongols fault because I guess what they did is they, they had a lot of princes, you know, like there were these large number of, of princes who were all included in, 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 in the royal family. And in, they, would, they would just sort of give different monasteries in central Tibet to different princes as their personal estates. Well, like we see in, in, in medieval England, right? Like that's why you would have like a certain, um, a certain English prince or duke would have certain lands and manors and, and the farmers would have to, um, were sort of um, tilling their fields and stuff, right? So, so it's, it's very complex the way, I guess, different Mongol princes um, um, were sort of, took over, well, tried to take over these different Tibetan monasteries. And, and I guess the monasteries would, you know, probably at the time, it's like, well, we don't want to just be killed by these Mongol soul warriors who are here. So we got to kind of work with them some way, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, it's, it's just so fascinating. And you, you have to make a um, mm -hmm. thing, um, comment in your text yeah the you, you say that um in the course of your mapping these sort of mongol strongholds you basically it was clear that they there were areas of tibet where they really um didn't go and did not have influence right and, yeah and you you um you suggest that this that finding could actually have implications for um, the current understanding, um, uh, at least on the Chinese side of what, of, of what belongs to China because, um, because part of that idea comes from um, the, uh, from the notion that Mongol occupation um, was sort of the origin of 
Okay. Right, right. Like, like the Chinese would say, well, during the Mongol Yuan dynasty, there was like um, a census taken in Tibet. Well, very general, you know, and, and there was a postal um, line of communication. They had like, you know, horses and relay stations so they could quickly send mail back and forth. And so, right, the Chinese would say, well, starting in the 1200s, then Tibet became part of China. But of course, anyone would say, well, no, Tibet became part of Mongolia. You know? <laughs> it, um, but that's the problem with these um, alien dynasties in Chinese history, because after, of course, the, the Yuan dynasty, and then the native Ming dynasty, you get the the Manchu Qing dynasty from 1644 to 1911. And these were, these were um, Manchus, you know, they weren't, um, that was an alien dynasty again. So, um, you know, but that's um, um, interesting that, um, right. So you can't really keep the Chinese from sort of s s seeing these as still being Chinese, you know, um, and, because there was no Han ethnicity historically. That was a, a 20th century invention of largely like President uh, Sun Yat-sen and the whole creation of a modern China after the fall of the Qing dynasty, this sort of creation of, of a Han identity and every, you know, like, so you, you can't say in the 1200s or in the 1800s, there was no such thing as Han Chinese, you know, like, right? so it's, it's, um, it's all um, open to, um, you can, you can argue it however you want. <laughs> Will there be time at the end for questions or? Uh, yeah, we, we, we should be we getting over? soon. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but a lot of Sakya Monastery is founded, interestingly, in Amdo which makes sense because this is where um, Sakya Pandita was sent with his brother, um, 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 Chana Dorje, right? Is that right? Um, and they met the Mongol Khan at the time, uh, Goden, right? And, um, um, and then in 12, um, the 12 was at 1251, Actually, Sakya Pandita passed away in this area near um, the Silk Road in, in the Gansu Corridor, as it's called. And apparently a, a chorten was, was built for him here. And I don't know if that held his remains, but I must, or did they bring Sakya Pandita all, you know, body back to Sakya, and put it in a chorten there, or did they, or did they put him in here? I don't, you know, I don't know. Um, but look at all the Sakya monasteries in this sort of bluish color. So, you know, the most monasteries found in an Amdo, it would make sense that they were Sakyapa, uh, probably because of the support of the Mongols, I'm thinking. Well, that's, this is, this is so, um, so instructive and, and helpful to see all of this. And I think, yes, um, and thank you so much, Carl. And we sh we would love to open it up um, for questions. Okay, good. For those who may have questions, so um, who uh, would go ahead? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, David, you've had your hand up a while. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you so much for this. Um, two quickies. Um, first one, kind of an ignorant question, but I uh, got to ask it anyway. For it deals with freedom of information uh, for people in other lands, specifically uh, China or Tibet. Uh, would they, would, a, would the average citizen who wishes to look at either the book or parts of the book that may exist outside of the book, do they have access to that? And that's one question. You know, I don't, uh, I don't think so. I, well, I brought hmm. copies with me and in like 2016, 2017, when I could still go to Tibet. So I would just give a copy to like a friend at like Tibet University or another Tibetan scholar, because I figured, you know, they're not going to be able to buy this in the local bookstore in Lhasa. So mm -hmm. I think that it's not uh, the China, the CCP won't let my atlas be, I think, stocked in bookstores in China. But if some scholars hand bring, you know, hand carry and copies, you know, they weren't 
they probably don't have a problem with that if um, you know some people just sort of have it, but who knows? You know, like the yes. way things are going, they they could start to, um, they could um, that could be considered um, an illegal book or something. And right. you know, right? Yeah, it's it's really horrible. The yeah, yeah. And okay, thank you. And uh, the second thing in in the book, I I think I was able to. Uh, Ani, Anila, thank you for bringing me into the library at the temple just two weeks ago. Um, you sat me down, and uh, I think you have the book in there, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And I just glanced through a little bit. So, do you in the book? Do you? Uh, I know that you obviously have the maps of the monasteries and the physical monasteries, but also I'm aware that. Um, that there are these such things as like tent monasteries. Yeah, right. And, yeah, and so, so I, I live right. I, I live near I live near Howell, New Jersey. And that's the um it, it's one of the congregating points where a lot of people who consider themselves Kalmuks live. Yes, the Kalmuk Mongols, yeah. Yeah. So uh, tent monasteries, that's the question. Well, right. So there's one great one I'm I'm looking for evidence of like an old photo of or where it was sort of located. Um the Daejong Rinpoche, the great Sakya Lama from Kham, who passed away in 1982, who was the main teacher for Gene Smith, right? Daejong Rinpoche, right? Who came, who escaped and then came to Seattle in the 19 um early in like nine, early 1960s his even though he was mostly at these great centers in calm like Derge and, and other great centers um apparently his actual monastery was a tent monastery and it was somewhere in what's now um Bayou northern Batong Litong the the pastoral highlands where Litong County Batong County, Bayou County, and what's now Ganza Prefecture of Sichuan. And it, but these tent monasteries, uh, they were like, think of a circus tent, you know, look how many people can fit. And so they could have like a hundred monks and their stuff, but they they probably would have moved a, three times or four times a year because all of their all of their yaks and horses would have eaten up all the grass around even within a day's ride of the tent. So they probably would have, after all the grass was eaten up around the tent area, they would move, but they might've only moved like 10 miles or 20 miles, you know, to, and then there's a lot a, enough grass to, for the animals to eat. So they weren't like moving every day. They, you know, they, they weren't like Western backpackers, you know, it's not like tenting, camping. It was, they probably had like a summer site and a winter site, I'm thinking, right? But yeah, there were there were a lot of there were more tent there were like a lot more tent monasteries in Tibet that we know about, and we know especially in Mongolia there were a huge number of tent monasteries. Uh, um, um, I think even more because of the way the Mongol, the the Mongol, the Mongol, Mongolian, the, the Mongol plateau. There's a it's mostly all pastoral. And so that they, they didn't have like the the resources to even physically build monasteries for, for uh, the first centuries of Buddhism. They were so yeah, tent monasteries are really interesting. Um, I guess today we just don't see them as much because people have trucks and cars, and you know they with the modern technology they can. Um, um, they could probably more easily get the resources to build. Yeah, yeah. yeah other questions? Yes, Robert. Um, yeah, hi. Um, I had a question about the, uh, you know, there's a very large swath of Tibet that is is it just completely not inhabited at all because it's such a, a, a harsh uh, environment? You know, I you mean, mean there, there's a very large area, of course, and I know, you know, I, I don't know the geography well enough, but it looks like it's just basically uninhabited, like large swaths of, say, Siberia. The the Jiangtan, the the great northern yes. plateau. So, right. I mean, I think is your that you're close to 
to Sakya and and Sam. If if it's only like a hundred miles, there 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 are still some some monasteries and, and and tiny villages and stuff. But you're right. When you get all the way up towards the border with Xinjiang and that mountain range, sometimes it's called the Kunlun Shan, the Kunlun Mountains, or the Altan Tag. It's 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 really dry and desolate. And and you're right. They're just there just wasn't any Tibetan habitation settlement in this huge, huge area of hundreds of miles. And and I was reading some historical accounts. It's it, there were Kazakh um, raiders based in in it was now the Tarim Basin, and into the early twentieth century, they would raid down uh, with meat eating camels. What they discovered again, historically, they developed were camels that could eat meat because there was nothing for the camels to eat along the way mm. so they would they could hunt the wild there were lots of wild antelope and, and all this wild game in that part of northern tibet because there are no people really so 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 they had to so what they would literally do is hunt they would you know shoot a wild a antelope cut it up and feed their camels the meat. And they, they discovered that they could, if they took really young camels and just fed them meat, they could, they could raise mm. a bunch of camels that could live on meat. And that's how the Kazakh raiders would come down to um, uh, all the way to the, where they could find some Tibetan areas. Um, so yeah, you're right. There just wasn't, um, uh, you know, it was really high and, um, and, uh, and uh, almost uninhabited. Mm, thank you. Yeah. It's fascinating. And that looks like Joe, please. Joe, did you have a question you need to unmute? Yes, oh, I yeah. did unmute. Do you hear me? Thank you okay, so much. Now, yeah. It's extraordinary. Um, can you, this is a pretty big subject, but can you talk a little about the cultural interchanges between these various regions and uh, the linguistic uh, differences? Well, I'm lucky that I was, I got to know the one of the greatest scholars of the Tibetic, of Tib the Tibetic languages, and, uh, a French professor, Nicolas Tornadre in, 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 in Paris. And he had been doing all through the 80s and 90s field work all across Tibet, where he would listen to people and, and he could write down, is this a, you know, what dialect this is? So he was the one who, if you look at my map and my atlas of the, we call him, he called him the Tibetic languages. And what it is, is it's like, apparently for a long time, people said that there was one Tibetan language, but there were dialects, like there was the Amdo dialect. But that didn't make sense because if Amdo Tibetans and like Central Tibetans would get together, they often would speak in Chinese to each other, unless because they're there it was so it's like Cantonese and Mandarin, you know, they're just mutually unintelligible. So, so he we've thought that really it's like the um, Germanic languages. You know how we say that German, English. Uh, Dutch, um, you know, whatever, you know, we say that like German and English are, they're both Germanic languages, but they're, they're, they're not, they're not dialects. It's not like English is just a bastard <laughs> dialect of German, you know, right? So it's a language. So, so to answer your question, there's lots of different languages in Tibet, like there's Amdo language, Kham language, uh, Utsang, Central Tibetan language, and that they should be seen as apparently um, languages under this big umbrella, of, of, you know, that goes back to old Tibetan, just the way that these Germanic languages, for example, would go back to Latin, right? So old Tibetan, that was, of course, the key to everything, just the way Latin was sort of what started all of these European languages. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And then the trade and the connections, you know, I mean, um, a lot was the was what was valued, like what did the Chinese historically value or the Indians value from Tibet? I mean, one of the big obvious things was yak tails, 
apparently yak tails were like used as fly swatters historically <laughs> right um what else and of course just like the the gold like gold 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 dust apparently tibet was always a rich in gold which was highly valued of course by the the you know the chinese and the indians and others right um mm -hmm. um what else um uh the so caterpillar fungus but i don't know if if that was just valued in tibet i don't know when outlaw other countries picked up on valuing yartsa gumba right the caterpillar fungus i don't you know i mean uh, maybe that's more of a modern um val commodity also the the the, sh the shikataki mushrooms of eastern tibet uh, apparently, once you started to have modern travel, like it became very valuable in Japan, right? And they're they're picked in the May and spring in Eastern Tibet. Uh, they're sort of, they have to be in an area, I think, with forest, right? But those mushrooms are highly valued and uh, mainly for eating, you know, but I think some some people value them as, as medicine, uh, yeah, so there's lots of natural products. I think, you know, traditional Chinese medicine, I think there were certain herbs and minerals that were sourced from the Tibetan plateau in traditional Chinese medicine. I think that they couldn't get um, in the lowland areas. Well, Carl, this has but been really fascinating. Are there uh, any other questions? Um, that anyone has. Well, it's getting late your time, right? It's like yes. Well, we want to PM, thank you, right? thank you very, very yeah. much for uh, your time tonight, um, and uh, okay. not only tonight, but there are decades of work that went into this book, and I hope that you're um, producing lots and lots of students who will carry. Oh this work forward uh, and deepen and enrich in it. Um, it. It's so helpful to us where, who've heard all these words and uh, things, but we don't have any idea how they place in relation to each other, not to mention uh, the trade corridors and the um, uh, changes over time uh, in the, who, who, who controlled them, all these kinds of things really come alive in your book. So uh, thank you so much for all of your uh, work for the benefit of beings. And uh, thank you, Emma. And thank you, Annie Jampa, for helping make tonight's uh, program come to pass. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Yeah, and thank you for having me. And um, I hope to see you all sometime in Walden again. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you all. OK, bye. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank, Good thank you. Extraordinary. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Ani.